Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast of Speaking the Truth About Money with Martin Coward and Joy the Wise Woman. I am both Martin Coward and Joy the Wise Woman. Martin Coward is my human name and spirit and, and Joy the Wise Woman is my spiritual name. We are both human and spirit. And so I'm very excited today to have as my guest, uh, let me if I get this right, uh, uh, <laughs> it's just so difficult for me in my English, but it's Aklawal. Yeah, yeah, almost. Aklawal. Aklawal. So I'm trying my best. It's, it's, it's a really difficult name for, for us English speaking people, but it's a beautiful name. And I've had a wonderful time right now in the last few minutes backstage getting to know this beautiful, beautiful human being. And he's really just an amazing, amazing young man. He is um, he's the founder and the creative director of Blackwater Productions. And he is also um, South African. He comes from the Swati community. or Would you call it a Swati? Is that considered a tribe or how, the Swati it's a, it's, a, it's a country, it's a kingdom, it's a culture, it's a people, it's a language. Okay. So he's a Swati. Yeah. Af Swati, South Af Af Swati, Swati South African. African. Yes. And he is a brother. He's got a twin. He loves dogs. He loves life. And he's here to share his story about how we can use film and how his love and his passion for filmmaking is changing the world. So I want to just step back and give you a chance to just share a little bit of your story of how did you get into this place uh, and where maybe a little bit of your life story that helped you come to the realization that you have a real gift within you that can make a big impact on the world by your ability to create really good films and video. So tell us a little bit about you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ole Loa, but you can call me Ole for short or for ease. Mm -hmm. I am the creative director of Black Weather Productions. I believe you said Black Water. That's the... Oh, American yeah. My, thank you for that correction. Yes, I yes. meant Black Weather. Yes, Black yes. Water is a great big uh, firm. It makes lots of money. And then hopefully Black Weather makes the same amount of money as well. But thank you for that correction. We do hope so. And my journey, I suppose, into filmmaking, I suppose... I think I knew I was a filmmaker very young. Uh, I suppose, as you said, I'm a twin. So yes, I've, I, was born, I wasn't born. I was born alone. I have a companion from the womb to the tomb. And throughout our childhood, I think I discovered that, so the thing when we were growing up, so my bedroom basically became like the playroom. Bedrooms, so all the toys were always in my room. So every time we had like a scenario between my sister and myself, we would always kind of play with each other. But it would be a scenario where I would kind of very much dictate what would we what would we be doing. So like the character must do this, the character must have this emotional journey and then they must do this and then the action scene must do that and then this must do that and then this must do that. And my sister's like, what about this? What about that? I'm like, those are nice ideas, but we're not doing that right now. And it's just like this, 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 that, 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 that. And then it was like, but luckily for me, I had a sister who was able to, uh, gave me that chance to be able to like kind of dictate because also, I mean, twins were very equal minded. So it's very hard. So I suppose, but I think she also taught me how to convince her of my ideas or maybe and help me better uh, speak or better, no, no, not pronounce, what's the, what's the English word? Better explain myself, I think. That was because a, a, as a kid, I used to mumble a lot. Like I was a notorious mumbler. I don't know if you can tell right now, but I used to mumble a lot. And my sister used to be like my translator. So I would say something, no one, everyone would ask, what did he say? And she would say, he said this. And it was like, oh, okay. So when I didn't, so I suppose that was, throughout my entire life until like varsity and then we started having our own lives and then I had to speak for myself or had to be more vocal for myself because I used to have so I'm very used to having my sister being my ally and then yeah so I think and then that's kind of and then discovering that because I suppose if you've ever watched Toy Story or Toy Story 3 and there's this moment in the beginning of the film where Andy's playing with his toys and I remember seeing that as like a 30 year old remembering it that's where the directing bug came from. It was when I was a child playing with toys and the control and just because I mean, at the time as kids in the 90s, I mean, we had Power Rangers and James Bond, all these things influenced us and all these things kind of shaped into what kind of narratives and kind of stories that I wanted or 
that I'm very much attracted to. I suppose that's where it kind of came from because even as kids, like my grandmother, we used to stay with our grandmother and she didn't want us to go to the cinema because of other reasons. I, I, I don't think I can tell you guys right now, but she basically would force us to go to Blockbuster and we would go to Blockbuster every Friday night and we would get like five VHSs of whatever we wanted and we would just go to town all the weekend long, just watch movies, watch movies, watch movies, watch movies. And that was what we did. And at least my sister also loved movies enough. So she became my movie fan, my best, I mean, we're best friends for life. So luckily we were, we were good twins, not the bad twins. I've seen some bad twins, but luckily we like each other. So yeah, so, so essentially that's, that's the inception of my, I would say filmmaking, because I don't, I don't want to say directing because there's, there's three types of directors. You have the, the writer director who wrote the script, who, who came up with the idea, and you have a director on the set who actually directs the thing, and you have the editor at the end who actually cuts it together. So there's always three directors in any given thing. So I always like, so I always, so I, as, a, as from Varsity, I think I started doing editing because that was just the technical, because I always loved computers or whatever technology kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that was my attraction to that. And then science and technology, and the arts is basically editing. So at least, yeah, so I got that. So that was my first hook into filmmaking. Uh -huh. And that's where it kind of, it grew from there. And I think it also grew from, I think it was uh, a piece I did in Varsity actually. It was kind of a piece called Lost Father because my father died when he when we were very young. So I, I, never, I don't know my father. So I wanted to do a thing where I took pictures of family pictures and I just cut out family members and then I represented that as my father and I played a very I think I played I can't remember which Coldplay song but of course it was a sad Coldplay song but it had hopeful it had like it was it started sad and it got a little hopeful and it ended very excitable but I suppose throughout that thing you kind of saw the journey of my whole life where this person has been missing through my entire life and that was kind of like the lost father kind of thing and then when watching that and watching like my my classmates, they were acting to it. They're like, they were some one, one cried and another one was very quiet. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't think I was able to make people cry or make or get a reaction out of people that way. So I was like, I mean, that was the point, but you know, sometimes you have a plan, but it doesn't go to plan and you know, the execution, you know. But yeah, so that was when I thought, I'm like, okay, I have a talent to manipulate emotions. So I must be careful with how I do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's very, very good. And I think we can initially we can manipulate emotions through telling our stories from a place of truth and vulnerability. Mm. And from what I'm hearing there is that you're you felt vulnerable because your father was missing from you and you missed him. Mm. And the beauty of that story is that you were able to create an, a, a, a connection with other people out of that feeling of vulnerability of this man that you missed into a beautiful story that, that attached that people could con that connect people's hearts. Very much. Yeah. Cause I thought, cause I suppose, I think it was that trigger realizing that, Oh, cause I suppose as, um, again, growing up in the nineties, I grew up watching Michael Bay, Roland Emmerich films. That's a, one of the best queer directors in the world. If you guys don't know, Roland Emmerich made Godzilla Independence Day, Stargate, Universal Soldier, The Patriot. So that was one of my big idols as a kid. So I was like, okay, I want to blow stuff up. Let's blow stuff up whichever fabulous, fashionable way we can do so. <laughs> but then you can't just blow things up without like an emotional crux or a core at the story. And that was what, again, as a kid, I was more obsessed with the action, action, action. My sister was more obsessed with that. So what's the story? And I'm like, okay, all right, we'll figure out the story. That's okay, let's, let's, let's figure this thing up. And I'm like, realizing that I think because when you when you want to interrogate a story, you have to interrogate yourself to kind of get a story out. So you have kind of really have to question yourself around the story and why you want to tell the story. Why do you should tell the story? And is the story any good to tell? And I suppose a good story to tell is one that kind of uh, haunts you. We always say that if it doesn't haunt you, it doesn't wake you up at three a.m. in the morning. It's not worth doing. Ah, uh, I know that feeling too. There's there are two types of things that wake me up in the morning. One is that maniac in my head that's that's making me feel bad, that's attacking me, telling me I should do this or I should do that. I should, or, and that's and that's a restless night. <laughs> but what I really love is when Joy the Wise Woman, my divine guide, wakes me up at two in the morning and says, I got something for you. Mm -hmm. Get up, make yourself a cup of coffee. Let's go downstairs and get out your pen and paper. We're going to create something. I love those. Sometimes when I do my very best work, is that what you're talking about? 
exactly those are the best i think i work much better at night like i love to sleep in i'm not a i'm a very much a night owl do not wake me up the only reason i will wake up is for a film set if it's not a film set leave me sleeping it is much wiser for you I will <laughs> warning. but uh in terms of back to so yeah at night time i suppose there's a thing where I always say, like our ancestors, because I suppose being a Swati person, being uh, African, we, are, we we do love our ancestors. So I always say, like that time of the night give is quiet is is quiet enough in the city or in the country or in the world enough for you to be able to hear what your ancestors are trying to send to you or trying to maybe allude to or trying to maybe suggest to you. I always say, like I feel like I get an email at 3 a.m. in the morning telling me, like. Hey, what about this cool idea? Do you like it? Do you not? Is it, oh, is it maybe useful to you? Or maybe it's something about your past, about your ancestors, about something you don't know about your family. And that's usually how it kind of comes out where it feels like something where, and then that's where it kind of, if, and it kind of needs to feel like that because I can't really make a film that, I suppose I'm hoping or I think that the films that I will always make will always relate to my family of some sort of kind of, it will always be something about my family. It's either this family member or this one, or I'm making a show about this one, but it's always, I'm always talking about my family because I just I think because yeah, family is family is very important to me. Yes, it is, and it's 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 much larger than we than we imagine. And if and this is this, I want to throw out an. I love to hear your thoughts about this idea. I've recently been listening to this guy who's been who has who's who's a meditator, and he talks about universal consciousness. Mm -hmm. And there is not a consciousness for planet Earth, and there's not a a consciousness for of another galaxy there is only one universal consciousness that's holding mm -hmm. everything in the universe together and as i become more aware of that i have become aware that that includes life forms from other galaxies mm -hmm. and it's all about this is always going on by the way it's just what it, what we humans do we become more and more aware of this if we get quiet and get still and listen to it like you do at night mm -hmm. and i'd like to hear go out beyond your your ancestors like your that the, in your family lineage and comment about your thoughts about including inside of our we are we are that consciousness mm. we are that conscious that's what we are we are consciousness that's mm. holding everything together that's creating everything holding it all together in a benevolent loving way mm. from my perspective and what i've been experiencing lately in my own meditations if I listen deeply, I'm actually hearing God. We might call them angels, but those are guides from other galaxies that are far more evolved than we are. And I believe planet Earth is somewhat of a newer planet in the in the in the in the universal system. And hmm. these are guides that came along that are coming along to help and guide us into our own uh, evolution and expansion here on planet Earth. Hmm. And one of the best examples of that are the pyramids. Of course. How did those get built? So I'd love to hear your thoughts if we're talking about consciousness and ancestors and energies. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Consciousness. That's an interesting... I suppose um, to feel consciousness relates to the universe as well because I, suppose, I always felt that there was this... Like, I grew up Anglican or I was raised wow. Anglican, so I, I suppose I was very much in the Anglican church, so I always felt like... I mean, that they tell you that Jehovah is God and Jesus Christ and all of the, the Holy Ghost. But then I also had friends who are Islam. I also had friends who were, um, they practice Hindi. I also had friends who practice Taoism. And so I was like, when you go to their homes and you see how their shrines are built, and you know, oh, those are different to, we don't have shrines at the homes as Anglicans. Usually you would go to church for that. But I'm like thinking, is my is what I've been taught the only thing, or is the is the absolute thing? And I'm, then I start asking myself that it doesn't. There's too many people, or and then when you start, and then, and then I start asking myself, okay, how long have we been here as human beings, like in terms of evolution? Like, okay, when you you look at these things that like we've been, we've evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and, and whatnot. I'm like, okay, so there's so much more as human beings we really don't understand, and then a lot of the time as human beings we're very quick to make a story or make a, an answer just for the sake of it instead of allowing curiosity and ignorance not i mean I'm not, ignorance is the bad thing but allowing space to allow maybe something else to kind of answer itself or maybe allowing and i feel like a lot of the times religions have kind of been a result of a uh, a need to to answer something that people are, are wary of because i suppose 
as every, as any given person, we always have a sort of fear, but we don't know what it is. Like there's this ungovernable fear that we have that we're like, is it, what's going to happen today? Am I going to do this? Is this going to happen to me as a meteor shower? You know, all these things that we can always, you can, you can go to town with what you think can happen. But I think it's always, it's a, it's a, it's a consciousness thing. It's a universal thing. And it's, I suppose, a faith thing that kind of relates. I, th- I always feel like that's kind of the Holy Trinity of, if those three things are more in sync with each other and those three things have more, are allowed to be curious about and question yeah. things, then we can kind of find a better universality that is actually an equilibrium for all of us. Where we, Because I'm always like, my thing is, is, is the, my journey is to find contentness, not to be happy, not to be sad. I mean, it's, of course you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad, but I want to be content. That's what the goal for me. I just want yeah, to- I, I love that. And I'm a fellow Anglican, and I love what you're saying, and you're articulating it beautifully. And, it's, and we, it, it really becomes down to, and all those, your friends that were Islamic or Hindu, it really comes down to the mystics within our, within our religious traditions that point us to the truth. And whether I'm talking to uh, uh, someone like looking at the, the poems of Rumi or looking at the teachings of Michael Estar, these are all the early mystics <coughs> within these various religious bodies. And if we look to those, those groups, those people, they're the ones that really can point, uh, point me to a deeper truth. Mm-hmm. And they're all pointing us to the same thing. And what much. Jesus called the kingdom of heaven, and I, this, is, this is something I believe to be, I'm Anglican, but I think the religious institutions created a, created almost a, a wedge, a, a block between us getting into the kingdom of heaven. Because like the Anglican church, which I'm a member of, us gave us this entire bunch of what they call the Nicene Creed, mm. which gives the people the illusion that if you become a, a, an Anglican or an Episcopalian in America and you believe these things, that's going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. And that is the furthest thing from the truth possible. Yeah. You don't need anything to get you into the kingdom of heaven except for to quiet your mind, open your heart and look in the, in the mirror and say, I love you exactly as you are. I mm. created you exactly as you are and you don't need to believe anything do anything except love and accept yourself exactly as you are and i think that's the teachings jesus taught love your god with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself because we're all one that teaching mm. by that sage is what i is exactly what we do in financial heart space what he called the kingdom of heaven and what Joe Dispenza calls the quantum field today because of science. We use the word spirit. We can use the word energy. It's all the same. Mm. You know, we didn't know what energy was back in the days of, of, of earlier days. But now that thing we can't see, touch or feel that's causing all the change. You know, we know that to be energy. Yep. And everything There's, can be explained by energy. So there is a very life force energy that is flowing that we don't understand that we might not be able to see it, but just because those things aren't visible to you doesn't mean that, the, I mean, I always feel like there's, it's either the guardian angel or there's some, I always, I don't like guardian angel because it always evokes more religious uh, yeah. emotions. So I prefer to say ancestors as, 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 a, as an African or as a Swati. I'm like, it just feels like you're, you, because I suppose a lot of the time we always say that your ancestors are always with you, but in terms of like how we see it is that you're, I suppose, your ancestors can walk with you and then they I suppose it's gonna I always feel like your ancestors are like are like how we perceive God to be answering a phone call and he's like, yes. Oh, I'm talking to this phone call. But I'm like, I don't think it's I don't think it's I always felt it was your ancestors, ancestors, ancestors are the ones answering the phone calls because they're looking at you and they're trying to protect you and trying to make sure yes, that you exactly. avoid things or you yeah. do certain things or you acknowledge certain things. And I always feel like that is more of the because there was always one great, I suppose, creator or one, I suppose, one mother earth. There's, there's it, only right? one. And, <laughs> and you know, and, and, I, and I, as you know, I'm very well connected with Africa through I met a young guy, a man named Ava Henry, who is my business partner now. And we're on this mission together. But I can tell you that my ancestors, he, his ancestors and my ancestors, which are the same as in your aunt, they're all the same heart. They're all the same oneness of, of souls in the world that everything mm-hmm. is. 
And I am, I am now, because of my connection to Africa, through him, I got called to Africa to come and help him mm. at a deep level. And I can remember before I ever met him, this sense of, of homeness, of coming home to Africa. I mean, I'm a pretty white guy, you know? But when I met Abba for the first time in person in Nairobi, it was like I came home to a deeper part of myself. And he did open my heart to a deeper room of love that I never knew existed. Mm. That, say, that's the beauty of the ancestors to me. Very much. Because I think when, so I grew up in the States and then we came back for the first time, I think we were around 12, 11, and getting off the plane and just smelling the soil and just smelling the earth. And just, it was, it was overwhelming because it was, was something I've forgotten, but then I have something that was very recognizable and very much a thing where it's like, this feels right. Or this feels like, because I suppose not to say that America and Canada didn't feel like home, but you could always say that, yes, these are temp, well, for me, because my grandmother was a diplomat, we knew that it was going to be a temporary residence. So like, we're not going to stay here for very long. So eventually when we get home, let's see what home is. Because I mean, we didn't really know as kids living in the States and Canada, and then we're like, okay, we're home now because we, as, as, as of course you can see, it's all Swati people. It's in Swaziland, so it's like it's it's, so it's a very, very much a very uh, it was a it was a great feeling of belonging and a great feeling of of just re because I suppose you're always taught about your culture, but you don't get to see it, and now I get to see it in live action. And I'm like, okay, this is now I can now I can now I can see my others because as a kid, they were like. No, I think I think you can still ask many Americans where is Swaziland? What is Swaziland? It's now called Eswatini. They're like, is that a place? Is that a thing? Is that a drink? What is that? They're like, <laughs> place <laughs> very much <laughs> landlord <laughs> between South Africa and Mozambique. So yes, it's so I think so when you so when you so when you have to explain to people that explain something that they don't understand and they plausibly want to doubt, and when you get to the place, you're like, okay, I'm home now. I don't have to, I don't, I can release your doubt. I can release your toxicity and I can take the, what I need from home. Thank you very much. I want, I want to take a step back and I want to talk about uh, some realities in Africa. And I want to, I want to ask you to maybe perhaps at the end of this, of this conversation and this, of this, of this concept, I want you to talk a little bit about what you might advise other queer Africans who are living in a lot more struggle. I mean, today you've come to the place where you are a successful filmmaker. You've had some advantages that maybe others have not had. You do live in a country, South Africa, which is more tolerant than many African countries that are like Uganda, where they have to kill the gay laws, where people have to leave the country or get their parents can kill them. So mm -hmm. what, you know, people can quickly, I know I can, when I see people who are successful and done well, it's like, it's like they don't think they can do it. They don't mm. think they have what they, they don't think they have what you have and they can get stuck and they can feel struggle and say, well, I can't do that. But the reality is, and you and I both know that they have everything in you. Everybody has, has that creative genius within them. And what would you say to someone, or maybe you share a story of where you've, you've really co conquered something that was challenging in your life that might help give some hope to a fellow queer African out there who's struggling to get by. What could you say to them to give them a sense of hope that they, they really have everything they need within their very own hearts to empower themselves? That is a tough one. Because I suppose, yeah, the African continent is such a vast, large continent. And I suppose specifically speaking as, as being a South African, I am very fortunate that my constitution is very much entrenched and very strong. And I don't, and I feel very safe here as a, but again, I have privilege that is beyond, I have male privilege, I have cisgender, I present myself as cisgender male, so most people don't question my sexuality at all. Most people assume my sexuality all the time. So I suppose within those spaces, I, I suppose I can, I don't wanna say it's hidden, but it's like I can pass much more easier than if someone was more flamboyant or someone was trying to be more of, it, and then but what, as an inspiration or as a, as a struggle piece. But I think, but that even got to a lot, that took a long time for me to get to the point where I felt that, oh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And I saw you, Bile, thank you very much, Bile. Thank you for, for being here. Um, 
Uh, my struggle was, I think, because my, so my struggle is, as soon as I have, so I, as I alluded before, my grandmother was a diplomat, so uh, she traveled around the world. Uh, she was able to take the family around the world. And through that, as a diplomatic brat, which is a kid of a diplomat, you kind of have to present yourself in a certain way. And the certain way you have to present yourself is this, not a shining beak, but this is a, a good representation of your country. Because if people don't know your country, you are the first and last representation of it. So if you represent it poorly, you could make yourself, and then it could all. So as a kid, I, th I felt my duty was to represent my country a certain way, but that meant I had to represent my, my representing myself took second or was in the back seat. The driver was the making sure I have to do it. Thank you very much, uh, Ushe. Nice to meet you as well. Um, so, it was, it was, so, it was, so, it was, so it was kind of a struggle of trying to figure out who am I in myself? Like, am I this person who's a representation of a country? It's like, yes, I am, because I'm very proud of being a Swati person, very proud of my nation, and very proud of having a kingdom. But I'm also, I understand that my kingdom has uh, issues in terms of queerness. So that was essentially why I suppose we, I prefer to stay in South Africa, but I'm also a South African citizen. So I have that ability. And again, I have that privilege of having dual citizenship with both countries. So I can kind of, so I think but the struggle for me, which is still a struggle for me, I think is because what I'm doing right now, I'm writing my first feature length uh, film, which kind of questions this idea of what is a legacy and what is a legacy and what, what happens when you want to question this legacy and maybe you want to maybe reject it entirely because the, the premise of the film is that this young man who, who suffers from an anxiety or debilitating form of anxiety goes to a Catholic school. His grandmother was the first bishop at the school, but for him, he at the school he goes to, a new boy comes from Canada and he has an immediate crush on him. Problem is that his family is very devout Catholic, so what does he do with this? Luckily for him, at the hospice he volunteers at, this old man, who has no love for religion and has tried to commit suicide unsuccessfully, they make a pact. The pact is the young man will help the old man kill himself as long as the old man helps the young man get laid with his new crush. So essentially, so why I wanted to make this story is kind of like it's my, I suppose it's, it's, it's my journey of trying to figure out what, what must I hold on to as like, because a lot of the time as Africans, we also have an added, I don't know, we have an added, we have to be the representation of our continent to the rest of the world because we have been represented so poorly for so long. So now it's up to us, the onus is upon us to make sure that as Americans or Europeans or anyone outside of Africa, you understand this is who we are now. You don't get to tell us who we are. We are now telling you the world who we are now. And with that comes the, the weight of what is that? Because as Africans, our history wasn't written by us. Some of our history was stolen and is, is in the museums. So, and then now we're struggling to figure out what we are in this globalized world where we're trying to compete with the world, but how far we're going to go to compete in globalization and what, as Africans, is African. And then we need to have this, I suppose, I think we, I feel like we're in this renaissance of really unpacking what it is to be an African because a lot of the time, a lot of our history starts from when we were colonized. And that's always, I mean, as a kid, I hated that. I mean, I went, I was also fortunate again that my grandfather was a very learned man and he loved, he always had an encyclopedia, he had the entire Encyclopedia Britannica at home and he had like the biggest dictionaries that I've ever seen. Like as a kid, I could never pick up a dictionary because I'd probably kill myself trying to carry it. That's how heavy it was. But every time he was saying, you don't know something, just go to the dictionary, go to the encyclopedia, figure it out. And I would like, okay, I'm curious about America. We're in America, let's go. America has this great five page spread about describing the whole entirety of America. I go to Swaziland, there's like two sentences of Swaziland. I go to Egypt, maybe there's two pages and that's probably the most we're gonna get as Africans. So, well. I'm, like, so I'm like, what are we? Or who gets, like, cause as a kid, like, like I, of course I had my Swati culture being living in the Swati home, but again, it's like, I need more. I need to understand more of the world because how I've been taught in America, America is very good at teaching the world about themselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't we though? I mean, and that, that is my, that is really where I think Americans have so, I mean, for me personally, and I got to, I'm just going to share this my own story. I love what you're saying. 
Americans, our culture is, and, and, and th- that a lot of my friends don't like hearing it, but this is the truth. We are very narcissistic. It's a very what's in it for me attitude. And we look at the rest of the world like almost like you don't really know what you're doing because we're Americans and we know better than anybody else how everything's done. Well, what I have learned in the last year as I've gotten to know Africans, specifically my business partner, Abba Henry, is that we have a lot to learn. And I would even say that Africans are a lot more evolved in the, in, in the evolution of hum, humankind than, in, than most of Americans. And if we would sit down, if we Americans would sit down and look at our own, I call them shadows or our own negative beliefs, we feel we're superior because we actually don't feel as good. That's mm. what's going on in energy inside ourselves. And that's what, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a shadow coach and I help people understand those shadow feelings, that sense of arrogance, that sense of nar- that narcissistic is a protection mm. from us. And the beauty and the thing is, if you're willing, if we will, if we Americans are willing to slow down and listen and get to know the African people the way I have, you will discover we have a lot to learn and a lot to be grateful for in our own life journey. And I can say that my life is richer, more exciting and more fulfilling since I have become friends with so many beautiful African, particularly queer African men who opened me up to seeing the world from a whole different lens of love and generosity that I did not even know existed before. Mm. So I really appreciate what you're doing in the world to help open up the eyes through filmmaking and storytelling that can help open the eyes of, in a loving way. And I want to do the same thing. I'm not criticizing it. It's just, it's just the way we were raised in our country. And it's, 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 it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation. And if we're able to see the flaw in that and slow down and say, wait a minute, we're not, we're, we're all one on this planet. We've got a lot to learn from you guys, and I appreciate that. I hope so. I mean, yeah, I think that that's very much the thing. I think even as a kid, when I wanted to learn that, I remember learning the term queer as a kid. I don't know where I heard it. And I went and ran to the encyclopedia, and I was like, okay, what does queer mean? Queer, they didn't really could, couldn't find a definition, but like synonyms were like eerie or misfit or something. I'm like, oh, that makes Because I'm like, as a kid from a different culture in America, I'm like, definitely, I feel like a misfit. Um, <laughs> queer. No one else is a twin. No one else is a twin in this whole school. So I'm like, that feels like a misfit. So I'm having these vicarious feelings. That feels like a misfit. So I was like, okay, this queer thing or this eerie thing felt like, but I always felt like it was an opportunity to see an alternative perspective because sometimes in life we get um, we get busy with the busyness of life and we kind of forget. Yeah, and that, and that, and that, and that, I appreciate that. We get busy in the busyness of life, but what we really get busy in is the busyness of our own personal agenda. Of course, we live in our own bubbles and we push yeah. our own bubbles. <laughs> and, and, when, and, when, and when people like you can sit down and get quiet enough and say, well, well what is my agenda? Is it, mm. is it my personal agenda so that I can be successful and be, and be and I don't believe so. Or is my agenda to make the world better and to mm. listen to my heart and, and, and tap into that creative, divine, benevolent, what we might even call the creator, the God, whatever you want to call that. And the, when I can tap into that and that is guiding me and I'm saying yes to that, mm. then we have the power to change the world. Very much. I completely believe that because I think I understand that my my journey or my my purpose here is to to help people laugh, laugh, help people question, help people maybe do a little distraction, but all in the vein of finding yourself and gaining hope for yourself. Because I feel like as if you can, it's always about an inward journey, I, I suppose. So if you can kind of, because I suppose if a film does its job well, it's a cathartic peace so you kind of like you need to feel like the film should be able to explain in the beginning what the issues are what the hero's journey what the struggles are you go through the struggles more struggles more struggles as is life and then through that hopefully you you can you come out hopeful but doesn't mean success is 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 always a subjective term it doesn't need to mean monetary gain but of course we all have money because money makes the world go round we live in a capitalist world unfortunately but within that i think our job as filmmakers 
is to instill hope. And I think that's, I got that from Say Mr. Banks. That was, I think, the film with uh, Emma Thompson and Tom Hanks about, uh, I forgot which one, but yeah. It was basically like, what is our job as filmmakers? Our job as filmmakers is to make sure that our audience leaves with hope. But you must, but I always feel like, but you must take them to a whirlwind of tornado of emotions. We must be an emotional roller coaster before we get to that hopeful bit because as human beings, oh, we're very arrogant about ourselves. We have very large egos sometimes. So we have to kind of knock that ego down a little bit. Uh, but I don't like to do a thing where you where you knock someone's ego down, but you don't help them up. So I always feel like ah. don't someone without trying, because it's kind of like don't don't insult someone just for the sake of insulting someone. Yeah. If you can if you can be aware of someone's flaw, don't make it a flaw. Make it uh, a building thing. Like, oh, if I see this thing, I'm like, oh, why don't you do? I don't have exactly, ex but it's it's one of those things where I'm like, it's better to build than to break. And I think we're builders. I think we're builders too. Yeah, I think I and I love that. So we're coming up on the half hour now. Actually, we've gone a little over, but I'm enjoying our conversation. So I didn't want to, um, uh, I didn't want to um, interrupt you because I just enjoy what you're having to say, and I think it's very, very. Very, very important. You're so welcome. Glad you came. Thank you for tuning in. Um, well, you know what? We're gonna this will be a podcast, and we'll send you the we'll send you the podcast when it comes out. Um, and you can take a look at that and you'll be able to stay in tune with us. So thank you for being part of this day. Um, and thank you. Uh thank you. <laughs> so, one more last thing. So you're a filmmaker, and what one film, or what would be, if, if you really, if, if there's a fellow African out there, uh, maybe a queer African, or anybody out there for that matter, that, that you would like to point people to, to get to really know you and your story, what film of yours would you send people to? to, get to know uh, I don't think I've made it yet, to be honest. Okay. Um, but I would say, I mean, my first official like film out of varsity was a film called Lost in the World. It was a short film. It was a film about a police officer who was a lesbian and her girlfriend was killed through corrective rape. If you're not sure what corrective rape is, it's the illusion or the delusion that um, heterosexual men rape lesbian women in hopes to turn them straight. So the film premise was that, so her girlfriend was killed by corrective rape. She's also a police officer, a police officer herself but her fellow police officers don't want to help her solve the case. So this throughout six months to a year, she kind of loses her soul, loses her mind, just because, because it's delusional. And then she kind of finds herself in the psychiatric ward. But within that, because I like to kind of play with the, I don't want to play a story like uh, ABC, I prefer to do it like B, C and A, just to kind of make you work for it. I yeah, I, yeah, I love that. Because that's, that's really how, nothing is created on a linear plane. Mm, Everything right. is created from a place of, of, of energy mm -hmm. that's chaotic. Yeah. Exactly. As, as creators, right. we all know that's why we that's why we get woken up in the middle of the night to go and create something because it's it's like I'm ready right now. I gotta go grab this and this and this and put it together and into something that people can understand. So what Very was much. what was the name of that film again? So that film is Lost in the World. You can find it on YouTube or, uh, yeah, you can find it on YouTube. It's, we put it publicly. But, it, yeah, it's a film about, so it's, it's basically a journey of of, of love, of self-sacrifice and losing your soul all in the vein of avenging your lover who no one else will avenge. But I suppose, and that's kind of, I suppose I, I wrote it in the vein of what if this happened to a lover of mine and I wasn't able to, help because I suppose a lot of the time I was taught as a like one of the only boys in uh thank you very much PC of oh, Brendan Campbell um that I was taught to protect the family so so if you can't protect your family not to say that you're no good but it's kind of like what do I do now what 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 am I left with do I just cower do I just sit and a lot of the time and the inspiration for the film came from me being part of a um a journalistic, um, so, so two journalists from Germany, from uh, they came down here to South Africa to film the all lesbian football team. But really, what really what they wanted to look at was corrective rape. So we went to different places and then got to interview different ladies and really understood. And I really got from there. I really got to place to better understand that yes, South Africa is a great democracy and, and our constitution protects everybody. But that doesn't mean. But for the ever, average day person, that doesn't. How does the constitution protect you? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, I agree. And people, and people aren't, and people have their own prejudices. 
and they don't really care about the constitution. And if you're and if you have a mob mentality, well, good luck to you. I mean, if yeah. you are the one and singular person, so it's kind of like thing. So I realized that okay, I need to make a film about the survivor, and it's not about and I don't want to make the survivor a victim. I want to make the survivor a survivor who will thrive and then be able to dictate what they want after their life or with their life. And I think that's where, I think, yeah, that will probably be, that's a, that's a, that's a good one to watch. <laughs> I'm to start with you. Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to, I want to make a short, a uh, uh, little commercial break for something we're doing very exciting on Financial Heart Space. Uh, my business partner, Abba Henry, and I have created a new virtual online global uh, LGBTQ global heart space coaching program, a coaching community to bring mm -hmm. unity in the world and to coach people how to bring that unity into the world. How do we create working, loving relationships for the betterment of our planet? And I'm going to mm -hmm. drop the I'm going to drop the link in this uh, next to the next to the video. But if you, I would love for you to anyone who's listening, if they want to become part of what we're doing in the world. Please join us in this wonderful new virtual global community, the LGBTQ Global Heart Space Community. You can just find us on, uh, you can just put that in. You'll find us on YouTube and uh, Facebook and, and, and all the other social media outlets. But we're very excited. We just launched that this week. We did it, we did it with a little short film called The Caterpillar, The butterfly and the human being it's about a four minute clip i'd love for you to see it sometime and get your thoughts about it it's 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 very raw and real this is the first time we've ever created something we had but we had a blast ab and i had a really good time putting it together i wrote the script and i did the narrating and he took all that and added some add some videos to it it's really kind of fun and it really tells the story of what this whole community is all about is that we're a lot just like the just like the butterfly, the caterpillar has no idea that it has wings to fly like a butterfly. Mm. Most humans don't have any idea they're so much bigger than what they think they are. We're, we're so much more than a human being. We are truly, truly both spirit, energy, and human. But the life force within us is that creative life force that's creating everything. And when we can plug into that and we can come to the realization that's who we are, then we have the power to change the world. And that's what we're doing. So join us over there if you'd like to. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me today, Ali. It's, I'm going to go with your with your more English name, Ali. Is that right? Because I can't, I'm going to yes. have a hard time getting that in, into your name. Let me try. But you did it there. Olala. Oh, Olala, yeah. Olala. Okay, I'm trying. I'll get there. Uh, and just, I don't know if you know it, but Desmond Tutu's daughter is a lesbian. She's an Anglican. He was your... He was your the bishop oh, for, you, yeah. of, 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 for years, and his, his daughter is a lovely person, and she is a member of our tribe as well. She and her wife live in the Netherlands. Mm. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but I just thought I'd throw oh, that out there. I mean, that's why we know uh, Desmond Tutu is who he was. That is the man who he was because of, I mean, I think that there was no other South African who just emitted love like he could emit love and just yeah. I, I he just gave me chills. I had the good fortune to get to meet him on several occasions when he visited America. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a good friend of my cousin's uh, and came to Atlanta. And actually, I think I met her when she was a little girl because I remember he had a big party for Desmond Tutu and his family when they were here, and they were just like little girls and young kids and. I remember meeting them and just thinking what a wonderful, well, loving, loving, loving man that he was. And uh, mm. just wanted to throw that in there since we're both Anglicans and part of that community. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you. And in the meantime, may love and prosperity prevail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.